Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Andrew Manning. Uh, today I'm going to try to tell you about um, how we're embracing the re-decentralized web to build sustainable research cyber infrastructure. Kind of use two screens confusingly. So uh, while there's too little time to share, you know, all the details of, of what I'd like to share, I'm just going to give you at least a proper introduction and pique your interest so you can learn more later. So first let me introduce myself and give you some context and give props to overview slides, give you some structure along the way. Uh, my career follows a trajectory that's probably similar to a lot of people here where I started with a research-based degree you know, with the goal of being a scientist and then as I meandered through different research positions eventually I found myself surrounded by computing experts you know who support science through software development and cyber infrastructure. So my doctoral work and the subsequent job in the private sector was in quantum physics uh, but like by the time I left Northrop Grumman it was clear I was the team member most interested in building cutting edge software systems, you know, more than the actual physics we were doing. And so when my family moved from DC to the Midwest, uh, Illinois, uh, I kind of embraced that opportunity to just go straight what is now called RSE. And so that's why I was excited to come here and meet people with a similar background. So what is this research collaboration CI and uh, what motivates it? So first let's look at the research collaboration part. Typically, the collaborations that RCI targets are, um, include scientific researchers from, from multiple, often international institutions, who find that their projects require data management as well as identity and access management services. And this is something that they typically discover when they begin considering their options for their tools and services, even like basic communications. Uh, somebody will say, let's use Slack, because that's what our university licenses, and that's what some of us are already using. And then the collaborator at another institution complains they don't have a license to Slack and their university uses MS Teams. And you know, then they try to start figuring out if workspaces can accommodate a certain number of people without going over a quota. Anyway, it ends up being a mess, as you're probably all aware. And eventually they conclude they need something more accessible and inclusive and more sustainable over the long term. Just an example. Uh, so now what do I mean by cyber infrastructure? Well. We can't go into all the nitty-gritty detail, not that you would want to, but this shows the basic components and gives a sense of how things are connected. Uh, cyber infrastructure here refers to this entire construction of interconnected hardware and software components. And the important characteristics for this talk are that it's a full-stack industry standard kind of component-driven system. Um, almost none of the components I'm going to talk about are things that uh, I created or develop, we developed at NCSA. We're striving for creative integrations, uh, if you will, that achieve a whole greater than the sum of its parts. And each layer of the software stack is mostly independent of the others, which is important both for its adaptability and for its how easy it is to migrate the different services. And then, of course, at the top of the stack, which I confusingly put at the bottom of the list, um, <laughs> I just noticed that, uh, is the actual tools and services the, research, the researchers use to communicate effectively and work well as a team. And our CI includes all the essentials here with very little reliance on external service providers. And so now I'd like to explain what I mean by the re-decentralized web and how it influences our design principles. Um, these quotes from redecentralized.org actually summarize it pretty well. They say, we've had enough of digital monopolies and surveillance capitalism. We want a world that works for everyone, just like the original intention of the web and net. And so thus this parathetical re uh, prefix is a way to indicate a return to the you know, partially idealized early World Wide Web, when anybody could have a website and reach anybody in the world, when it was uh, not so much constrained by the walled gardens of companies like Facebook and Google. Um, we seek a world of open platforms and protocols with real choices of applications and services for people. We care about privacy, transparency, and autonomy, and our organizations and tools should fundamentally be accountable and resilient. Uh, there's a lot packed in here we're not gonna talk about. I'm just giving you the ideological background a bit. And we strive for an ecosystem of interoperable products, you know, letting people choose their software and keep the data themselves. So as this wording suggests, in this context, decentralization encompasses both an ideological perspective as well as a technical approach to achieving capabilities that are otherwise not found in the predominantly centralized commercial solutions. 
Uh, and by calling a tool or service decentralized, we typically mean that it involves a network of federated servers or a distributed peer-to-peer -peer network. So with that general idea of decentralization in mind, uh, you can start to appreciate some of the driving principles guiding our design choices. Uh, researchers should have as much control as possible over their data, services, and their access control. And responsibility should be, should be distributed even among the collaborators effectively. So you're never, it's never disproportionately held by you know, one or two sysadmins. Um, free and open source software is the preferred solution whenever possible for both ideological and practical reasons because vendor lock-in and changes to terms of service and commercial solutions are a real problem, especially for academic uh, researchers. Embracing decentralization means that we self-host data and web services when it's advantageous, and we select applications that prioritize data ownership, which kind of implies a commitment to privacy and portability. There's plenty of innovation in the creative integration of existing open source applications, and these innovation, innovations can enable better research outcomes. Uh, we should leverage existing work whenever it's feasible. And then the final, I guess, driving principle is that the collaboration CI should be as portable, again, as possible for the sustainability of the project. We talk a lot about sustainability. Uh, funding agencies definitely say that, but there's often not a technical way to achieve that uh, in practice. So this addresses some of those concerns. So enough of the theory, though. Let's, uh, what are the actual capabilities and integrations in use today? Uh, before I answer that, I wanted to note that this CI is in active use or was used by uh, a variety of research collaborations. There's the DES Access Science Gateway, an HPC backend for the Dark Energy Survey. Uh, we adapted the multi-messenger astronomy alert processing pipelines from Antares, a NOAA lab uh, project. Um, yeah, the Science Gateway, an HPC backend for the South Pole Telescope, which is a millimeter wave uh, astronomical survey. Uh, the full suite of tools and services used by a new collaboration called Muses, um, a collaboration studying the exotic states of very dense, very hot matter, and also education and outreach activities like our Girls Astronomy Summer Camp that we host every year. Excuse me. So this list uh, includes some of the most common tools and services needed by a research collaboration and which open, and which open source solutions that we have selected to meet those needs. And all of these are some subset are deployed for the projects I work on. And so I'll just introduce them so you get a feel. Uh, the first two address like the most basic needs, cloud file storage and a communications platform. Unfortunately, many people would say that email is sufficient for the communications platform, but I'd be here all day if I articulated the reasons why this is not the case. Um, I will mention that the important point is that the reason everybody falls back to email is because it's the open decentralized protocol <laughs> <laughs> that allows anybody to message anyone else, uh, no matter what their provider is, right? It's a federated system. And so uh, I think if you want to hear more, you can provide me a soapbox to stand on after a few pints, if you're willing to indulge. So for file storage, though, we use NextCloud. Uh, it has group calendars and a wealth of other capabilities too extensive to, to mention here. But it's a fantastic open source success project that used to be called OwnCloud a long time ago. It's German-based, uh, and I've been using it over a decade myself. But it's, it's wonderful, and it's kind of the backbone of a lot of this stuff. Um, next, we have Discourse, which is a highly popular forum software used by you know, countless projects for their community discussion platform. Uh, it offers a myriad well-crafted features and capabilities and is specifically designed for a dynamic community and supports a pretty broad range of use cases. You've no doubt, as a bunch of computer nerds, encountered Discourse forums. So. <laughs> Now this one has a surprisingly low awareness uh, in my experience. So complementing the forum style discussion supported by Discourse, we use Matrix for real-time messaging and teleconferencing. It's an amazing and rapidly growing project that actually started right here in, the, in England. And it's building a fully open and decentralized messaging platform. It's been adopted by large organizations, including the French government, the German national healthcare system, and others, just to name a few. Uh, and it, one of its explicit goals is to act as a bridge between otherwise um, disparate or isolated platforms. Like they can bridge Slack MS Teams with Slack, for instance, which is a very practical use case for a lot of uh, organizations. Of course, they'll find out they could just use Matrix directly, but <laughs> whatever. It's, it could be a bridge to independent services. So we offer HedgeDoc for collaborative, um, you know, Google Doc style editing. 
Um, project web pages are hosted by an instance of discourse, you know, providing not only a robust CMS that everybody knows, but allowing collaborators to share the burden of updating the content, posting news articles and such, as opposed to a static site that you have to go to your, you know, IT support staff or something to, to edit. For, of course, JupyterHub is, you know, king of the integrated development environment for groups like this. You all know Jupyter. So we use that same Kubernetes uh, Helm chart that you're referring to. And so basically while all these services are independent third-party solutions, collaborators authenticate to all of them using our unified authentication system, which you sometimes hear as single sign-on, and I'm sure you're all aware of that and have experienced it. Uh, so I'll talk about that briefly, because it is such a <laughs> critical puzzle piece. So I, this identity and access management component is, is an important part of this. Like gone are the days when you would generate individual usernames and passwords for people. Uh, that's not only a major security risk, but it's just, it's just a pain for everybody. We have so many usernames and passwords. There's no reason that you can't use an, existed, an existing trusted identity provider to prove that you are who you claim to be, basically. Um, and so we implement this idea using a combination of a Keycloak server, which is an open source authentication system, and a service at NCSA called CI Logon that is really just acts as an identity provider broker to thousands of institutions around the world, pretty much every university. It includes Google, GitHub, Orc ID. Um, so this approach embraces in decentralization in that no individual identity provider can prevent someone from accessing and using the system. You know, you're not beholden to a, a single provider. I was gonna do a little demo of this, but I think you're all probably familiar with this concept and uh, I don't really know how to do it technically at the moment anyway. Um, but suffice it to say, the scheme satisfies two important criteria for our CI. Um, because, because all the tools and services only see this Keycloak server, it's possible to swap the CI logon service with anything else uh, without reconfiguring the applications. And so the CI is very adaptable to a project's changing needs and available resources, say money. CI logon costs money if you're outside the university. Uh, this also makes it possible to migrate to another host institution without affecting user accounts. I don't know if you have experience doing any of that, but if you don't have a system that's sufficiently decoupled, it's a nightmare. Uh, so, as I've said, I don't have enough time to introduce all the ways researchers use this system, but I'd like to share some of the use cases and integrations that give you a better idea of what it can do. Uh, most of us, if not all, have suffered this experience of being on a project that has one or two sysadmins that are effectively gatekeepers for changing anything. Uh, embracing decentralization here even applies to group organization and workflows. So admin privileges and responsibilities should be distributed among collaborators, but in order to do that, you also need the technical tools that enable it. And so our authentication system supports this approach by defining access control groups within Keycloak, which then inform the applications about your group memberships and so forth. So you can have different you know, hierarchical, group, hierarchical groups that let some subset of your collaborators update the website uh, and others be JupyterHub admins so that, you know, you as an RSC in particular in this, <laughs> this audience are not having to troubleshoot everything. You can say, look, you guys can do the JupyterHub administration stuff. You can handle 99% of the problems until it hits the Kubernetes level. And then of course, I've got to help out. So speaking of Jupyter Notebooks, uh, a simple yet powerful integration is to just mount a storage volume between JupyterHub and NextCloud. And this provides a common file system not only the researchers can use within their Jupyter Notebook environments to share code and data, uh, and you can also take advantage of large external data storage uh, in your particular framework, but uh, you can also take advantage of NextCloud for its syncing cap capabilities and its uh, sharing capabilities. So earlier I mentioned that nextCloud is a federated storage system, that decentralized aspect. And so what I mean by that is they're not limited, you're not limited to choosing whether you share something with good uh, access controls within your little bubble or just throwing out you know, public share URLs that you hope people can keep track of. Federated system means that if I want to share with an external affiliate some notebook or data, then using this kind of common storage drive, I can use their federated cloud ID if they have a NextCloud server, and then they can like, securely and robustly share that data. It just appears alongside their files if they accept it. It gets synced to their local workstations if they want, and so you can really improve the efficiency of your work. 
I hear these stories about people emailing zip files of data and you just, you know, it's 2022, <laughs> we can do better. Um, so anyway, you can, you can imagine how this would also benefit collaborations in many other contexts. Like if a collaborator leaves and goes to a different group and now they're suddenly outside your little authentication bubble, then how do you securely sh share with them? This, or they just, or the project ends and they have a follow-on project. You can, you can imagine the use cases are endless. So while we're talking about moving data around, uh, I wanted to mention our use of SyncThing, centralized platforms like Globus. How many of you have heard of Globus? I don't know if that's just a US thing. Okay. Um, they offer a wealth of services to da for data transfer, uh, but there are large costs associated with those kind of services that can be prohibitive for smaller organizations. Uh, personally, I'm in love with SyncThing and I've been happily using it for many years. Um, it's a little bit of an oddity in this CI because it is a truly serverless peer-to-peer -peer solution, so you don't need it to be deployed in order for it to be useful. However, we deploy a persistent peer. That way, our researchers can have a large data capacity and always available peer like you traditionally expect a web service to be. And so we view this, we have used this, for example, in the Dark Energy Survey, which handles large amounts of data. When individual researchers have, you know, maybe done a lot of data processing on their local laptop or workstation, and then they need to send it to NCSA to be published, uh, SyncThing makes this a fire and forget operation. Uh, and you don't have to provision user accounts on the host institution's computing systems, like rsync or S, uh, SFTP would require. Uh, not to mention the, well, I could talk for an hour about SyncThing, but in any case, it's a, it's a nice, service to provide. Uh, a lot of the integrations we, we have uh, created rely on a custom API server uh, that often acts as the glue between components. Um, while the source code is not identical between each of our projects, uh, we kind of keep a consistent framework. So updates to the capability on, say, the SPT project can benefit dark energy. If, you know, Currently, it's just an HTTP compatible web server written in uh, Python. Uh, Tornado Web, we're hoping to transition to Django, but um, before I talk a little bit more about that glue functionality, I want to mention that one of its core capabilities is a job management system. So a lot of the research use cases that you guys are very familiar with involve processing jobs that utilize HPC resources. And so that uh, kind of implies that you have some sort of job management system that your researchers can go kick off a job and then manage it, figure out whether it's finished. And those backends can be diverse. Uh, one of the backends can be the Kubernetes cluster itself. And so that's one of the things we support out of the box. In Muses, we're working to support this new Delta system that's very GPU heavy that they've um, started at NCSA. But that's just an important component of this for many, increasingly many research collaborations. Here, I just wanted to give you an example of the glue functionality um, that we use. Uh, like you can imagine that a visitor of our WordPress powered website follows a link to register as a new collaborator. In the process, they log in for the first time with the Keycloak server, and thus they, you know, thereby establishing some account. Uh, our custom API server then, you know, does some logic and sends out an email to people that can approve or reject this request, you know, including special sauce in the link, so that if it's, if the link is approved, you know, the link is clicked for approval, then it again hits an API endpoint on this custom server, which then talks to Keycloak and uh, sets up and provisions their default groups for access control, goes to the discourse API, sets them up there. So you kind of see how your little custom API server executes all the logic and connects these otherwise disparate uh, third-party applications, and that adds a lot of value. In fact, this is kind of reproducing something of a previous NCA product called co-manage, which I didn't learn about until after I'd been working on this for a while, uh, but the redundancy was not, not in vain. It actually seems better in some ways. How much, how am I doing on time? Okay. Uh, so I hope this talk has given you at least a glimpse of what RCI can do, and I'll just conclude with a little recap and some observations. So we've developed a full stack CI for research collaborations that's reproducible, flexible, portable, and sustainable and it embraces decentralized open source solutions. Um, researchers across all fields of science increasingly require cyber infrastructure 
to make progress. And this expanding demand is the primary driving force behind the growing need for people like us, RSEs. And so the CI we're designing addresses a range of emerging issues. For the system administrator, it's a force multiplier, leveraging the power of Kubernetes and this GitOps paradigm, which I did not define, but I'm just gonna throw it up there, uh, to allow one sysadmin to maintain uh, robust computing services for many users. I personal, personally am at the <laughs> strained limit of <laughs> of that force multiplier, um, but it is amazing how many things you can support. So for researchers, it offers a seamless authentication system and integrations that are conducive to information sharing, collaboration, and just getting work done. And for the research community overall, it offers a vision of the future in which access control data sharing between independent collaborations is far less reliant on sysadmins and centralized services. Uh, Finally, I'd like to advertise this nascent branding of this cyber infrastructure. I'm not even sure whether to pronounce it decency or decent CI. It's a pun after all. Um, we're trying to iterate on logo concepts. And anyway, if you'd like to learn more, you can join our forum to stay in touch. Forum's discourse, just in case you were wondering. So thank you. If you don't want any on-premises hardware, what are the off-premises NextCloud options? Um, are you asking whether there are NextCloud hosting providers? Whoever, I, okay, I just wanted to see who asked the question. <laughs> no, no, they, that is one nice thing about NextCloud and Discourse. Because they're open source and they, they, they're very mature, there are uh, pretty cheap hosting providers that are independent even from the original organizations. Like for instance, yeah, NextCloud, there, there are plenty, and I've, a lot of them are European based. So that's been very annoying to me when I've been seeking them, but great for you guys. Um, it's not really a big surprise that Germany, France, and uh, England have been leading a lot of these open source, decentralized, privacy respecting systems. And even though there's a, a large number of people like me in the U.S. that support it, the U.S. is also like the host of, you know, your, what were your alternatives, your, your competitors, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. Those are your cloud providing <laughs> competitors. So um, anyway, I'm happy that Europe is doing that. But yes, there are many options. Uh, do you use decentralized tools for software development? within the cyber infrastructure framework you described? For instance, do you offer a decentralized GitHub alternative to host? Uh, we, we did use Git-T, which is a decent, uh, is an open source, you know, GitHub-like experience. I would probably, like, it's a very lightweight option. I did that for a while, but uh, typically we just run, we just use gitlab.com uh, and GitHub, just sort of willy-nilly. I feel less worried about that unless you get two vendor lock-in uh, with their workflows, you know, because as Git is inherently decentralized. So as long as you can take your code and run it somewhere else, then it's okay, which is sort of why I prefer GitLab, because they still offer that as a self-hosted uh, option, you know. So in principle, you could move it. Is there a place where you describe your setup in more details? Would that be the decent CI? Yes, uh, I, I have made a reasonable landing page, and we have some documentation in a like kind of a root repository, but it is still early days. So um, of me trying to consolidate and uh, this into a separate product disentangled from the different project uh, scientific collaborations it's in use for. But clearly this is, this is very generic. I mean, a lot of the stuff is very generic. So that's what I'm trying to define here with decent CI. Uh, is the cyber infrastructure framework itself something that other institutions could adopt and deploy themselves? Definitely. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a little weird in some ways to even call it a, its own product or project because it really is an amalgamation. But as you guys well know, there is a tremendous amount of value uh, and time and effort involved in integrating so-called existing solutions. I mean, that's, that's something that's become very evident to me. You can have a great tool or service, but if it's kind of just off by itself, then nobody really knows how to leverage it. Do you also have a decentralized governance model and how is it managed? Can you clarify what you mean? It's okay if you're too nervous. Do you mean like in the open source project? 
Um, yeah, no, I guess we don't. Yeah. Not yet, at least. <laughs> Thank you so much, Andrew.